Welcome to the first Godot devlog for Towercraft, a roguelite tower defense where you build the map and craft custom towers. I'll be covering what I was able to accomplish during days one to seven, from creating the camera rig to making enemies. The first day of the project. This was the day I started my journey of creating Towercraft in Godot. And this was the day I spent the entire stream creating a camera rig from scratch. I implemented movement, zoom, and rotation, then tweaked it so it felt pretty good to use. We started day two having a wonderful time in Blender. I really do love Blender. It's, it's actually my favorite program. Whenever I use Blender, I, I get this wonderful feeling of wanting to bang my head against a wall. After what should have been five minutes, but ended up being literally 40, I had two tile segment sculpts imported into Godot and ready to use. I made each tile spawn three of the path segments and three tower segments, spun them around the center, and ended up with what you see here. Day three was the start of implementing tile placing. In the prototype, I elected for a sort of drag and drop implementation where the tile would just snap to where you put your cursor. For the full version, I decided to just completely copy Dwarf Romantic because my God, the tile placement in that game is so freaking good. This mechanic, the tile placing, is the backbone of the entire game. So it's important that I do it right. Which is why I completely avoided implementing a global hex coordinate system and attempted to base everything relative to the position of the starting tile. Oh my god. To my credit, I did get it working, but in the following days, I would soon find out that because there was no global hex coordinate system, enforcing valid tile placement would be almost impossible. And I also learned what radians are, so that's fun. Day four, the day where I bite the bullet and learn how to do hex coordinates. The first thing I did was create the tile dock. I made it so when you clicked on a dock tile, it would spawn a matching real tile that you could place. And after that, I spent the next six hours implementing a hexagonal coordinate system for my tiles. Without the coordinate system, the only way to reference tiles is through other tiles. This becomes a massive issue for when I need to do things such as figure out where ghost tiles should spawn or checking if there's a neighboring tile in a specific direction. Each tile having their own coordinates makes my life so much easier. I don't have enough time to go over exactly how I did it, but the only reason I was able to do it was because of this page from Red Blob Games. I highly recommend checking out the page if you want to learn more. Link in the description. I chose to use a cube coordinate system, which is like a normal grid coordinate system, but with an additional axis. It took quite a while for this to make sense to me, but eventually it clicked, sort of. The main reason I chose cube coordinates was because you're able to apply vector operations to them. For example, you can add a direction vector to a coordinate to easily get the neighbor in that direction. By the end of this very long stream, I had a working tile dock and every tile and ghost tile had their own coordinates. I spent day five making sure ghost tiles only spawned where you were allowed to place tiles. Tower tiles can be placed adjacent to any existing tile as long as the last dead end is not blocked. Path tiles are a little more strict. One, they must be placed adjacent to an existing path tile. Two, a path on the path tile must be connected to an existing path. And three, placing the path tile cannot cause the last dead end to be blocked. I created two dictionaries, one filled with the tile objects that you key into with a vector three, um, that vector three representing the tile's coordinates. The second dictionary is filled with zeros or ones that you key into using a vector three representing the ghost tile's coordinates. The, the zeros and ones um, represent whether or not the ghost tile is in front of a path. These two dictionaries made it easy to ensure ghost tiles only appeared where the currently selected tile was allowed to be placed. It's finally time to add enemies. I started day six with creating a placeholder enemy. I wanted two small enemies to be able to stand next to each other on the path and not have too much overlap. For this to work, the enemy needed to be really small or the path needed to be wider. So you know what that means, back to my favorite program. After making the path wider, I was able to make enemies the size I was happy with. Big enough to be able to distinguish them from a distance, but small enough so the path wasn't taking up the entire tile. Adding portals that spawn enemies was next. These portals appear at every dead end and update as you place path tiles. 
Getting this working was relatively painless, thanks to the coordinate system. With the portals spawning correctly, it was time to do pathfinding. But before that, I wanted a way to visualize it. For points, I just instantiated a sphere, and for lines, I used an immediate mesh resource, which allows you to procedurally create meshes. With the debug drawing working, it was time to add pathfinding. Godot has an A-star pathfinding system built in, so I use that. Every time a new path tile is placed, a node is placed at the center and is connected to the center node of the adjacent path tile. A node is also placed at the portal and connected to the center node. Whenever a portal is spawned in, it generates a path from the closest node to the node at the castle. Then, when enemies spawn from the portal, it gives them that path. The path is just an array of coordinates. Finally, I wrote some simple code to make the enemies follow the path. It makes them move forward a little bit every frame and also look at the next point in the path. Once it reaches the point, it looks at the next one and keeps doing that until it reaches the castle. Tile dock animations were very messed up, so I started day seven figuring out a better way to animate them. I probably could have got it working purely in code using tweens, but I really wanted to use the animation tree with an animation node state machine. Each dock tile had three states that I wanted to transition cleanly between, idle, hovered, and selected. I realized if I made each animation just a single column, just a single keyframe, the state machine perfectly transitioned between them. I'm extremely happy with how this turned out, and I plan on using this technique more in the future. After that, I tackled sounds. I wanted to make a sound manager that handled all sound effects. It needed to be able to play any sound, multiple times overlapping, with the ability to randomize the volume and pitch. To handle playing the same sound multiple times, it uses an audio stream player object pool. Basically, when a sound needed to be played, it grabs an audio stream player from the pool and uses it. If it needs to play another sound before the previous one is finished, it just grabs another audio stream player from the pool. When the sounds are done playing, it puts that audio stream player back into the pool. It's a pretty robust system and it worked really well. To end the day off, I wanted to make the enemies round the corners smoothly. I honestly thought it wouldn't be too bad, but the more I thought about it, the more complex it got. Fortunately, I was able to find a tutorial that kinda did what I needed. It was a tutorial on smoothly looking at the mouse. I was able to apply it to my enemies, but my God, it was, it was a pain. The reason it was such a pain was because it was hard to figure out what was going wrong. I had a way to visualize the vectors using my line drawing and point drawing, but, but still. After three hours, I finally got it working. The enemies now smoothly follow the path. So that's what I was able to get done in the first seven days. But before I end the video, I have some exciting news to share. The project now has a dedicated art lead, a role previously filled by me, I guess. He goes by The Real Fluke on all socials, and you can see some of his concept art on screen now. Fluke's a fantastic artist and has experience as an art lead on previous game projects. I'm really excited to have him on the team, and I hope you guys are excited for much better art. And that's it for this devlog. Next one will be on a bunch of tower-related stuff, so if you're looking forward to that, subscribe so you don't miss it. Also, how do you guys like this format of going like day by day and covering what I did? Would you rather me go over the bigger features but more in depth? Let me know what you liked and what you didn't in the comments. It helps me out a lot. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you in the next one.